what is important to your business? What would need to change to keep up with change? And how are you going to adapt? And how are your business going to survive? So to answer some of these questions, I have invited some fresh thinkers from our Hong Kong community. Are you ready to hear what they have to say? Yeah. Great. I guess the first speaker probably won't need an introduction, but I'll do one anyway, because I spent the time actually writing one. So, Yatsiu. Yatsiu fits this theme perfectly. He was named Global Leader of Tomorrow by World Economic Forum. He is passionate about entrepreneurship, education, and he's also passionate being a father of three. He is passionate about solving big problems to make the future a good thing. Yat is one of the first tech entrepreneurs in Hong Kong with his first business back in 1993. And then, of course, Outplace from 1998. But if you asked him when he was growing up in Austria, training to be a musician, he wouldn't probably answer tech entrepreneur. But as he stands here tonight, his background on how to live in a world full of surprises and constant change will fit very well into the theme of tonight. So Yat, the stage is yours. So I'm going to talk a little bit uh, in the sort of 10, 12 minutes that I have about sort of our views of the future. And uh, I'm not going to talk about the business at all, so don't worry, it's not a pitch. Um, but I'm going to talk about some of the think tank stuff that we've been exploring. 2025. And since we don't have that much time, I'm going to focus on just three points. And one of the main areas I want to focus on is generations, right? So already again, in this particular room, we have multiple generations as well. But what's the, what's the impact? Ten years from now, everyone who's in primary school, everyone who's in grade school, they're going to be at some point different where they are. Except the difference is that technology is going to change the way they interact and, the, imp and the, the definition of what that generation is like. This example is, of course, a traditional sense, right? This guy is probably 60 or 70, and that kid's probably sort of, you know, 17, 18, whatever, and that would be what we normally define as a classic generation. But technology has changed all of that because one, we know that bandwidth is going to be complete, is going to be uh, almost zero. You know, the Raspberry Pi just launched. Uh, it's a $5 computer that basically has a CPU power of, you know, you know, um, a standard Windows computer of like five or six years ago. Uh, and we know that because of Moore's law, uh, this kind of accelerated pace is just going to continue, where basically you're going to have more bandwidth, more speed, and more power going forward. But when you apply that with a, with a view of generations, and you take a look at that, which is a classic view of a generation where many of you are probably Gen Z or some of you are Gen Y, something doesn't really make sense here. Because if you look at the definition of Generation Z, for instance, uh, which is essentially the age that was grown into Windows 98, and then say that this person has, is also similar to the person who's using Facebook or s is familiar with Twitter, something doesn't make sense. In fact, if you look back, if you look at, for instance, just the, the smartphone generation, people who use you know, Nokia phones versus people who use smartphones, that gap in itself is actually only seven years. And in that gap, everything has changed. So it makes more sense to actually start dividing the generations in much smaller segments. Right? And in fact, the way that we look at it is, is that these segments, because of technology, are going to compress. That means the definition of a generation is not going to be 20 to 30 years like you normally expect. It should be really five to 10 years tops, which also means other implications. Uh, example, what, for instance, in your home, if any one of you have children, you realize anyone under the age of five or four is going to be interacting with technology very different than someone who is 10, 11, or 12. Right? Everything is touchable. Everything is something that you sort of touch and feel and do versus the 15-year-old or the 12-year-old or 13-year-old looks at it still in a traditional sense with a computer and a keyboard and an input device. But perhaps another example here from in terms of generations is, I mean, and I guess all of you are kind of youngish, so I'm not going to make that assumption. However, how many of you love a clean inbox? Okay, all right, fine. So generationally, you guys are old, okay? <laughs> and the reason why is because you've grown up in an environment of limits. You believe that you need to organize things because you need to make space for something. Right? But the generation that grows up in unlimited data environments doesn't believe that because they don't even care about data limits. Right? Photos, no problem. Let's just go put them on Google Photos or put them somewhere. It doesn't matter. Everything's searchable. So it's basically like a messy bedroom versus a very clean one. Right? But that's just one such example. The other example in terms of generation is if you look at voice. Right? How many people here actually interact with voice on their smartphones? Okay, the Googlers, all right, fine, all right? <laughs> yeah, you guys don't count, right? But I mean, other than that, right, you can see. And the reason why, again, is because you grew up with tactile 
uh, keyboards. In fact, you grew up with a QWERTY keyboard that was designed 100 years ago, really, so that, so that it was hard to type to get the, to get the keyboard so the keyboard wouldn't get stuck. That's actually the design of the QWERTY keyboard. But you're used to that. You've been trained for that. So for you, the idea of using voice is not typical. However, for children, especially under the age of seven or eight, voice is the way to communicate. They're not even thinking about basically you know, uh, typing, right? And so it's not just because voice technology is better, it's because it's just more convenient. Now think about that in terms of generation. One generation ago, when the iPad and, and the smartphone was introduced, they were all touch-based. So they're gonna grow up in an environment where they want to touch everything. But this new generation, which is only basically coming up five or six years behind us, is gonna do everything on voice because they're searching YouTube for kids only on voice. They're, they're able to have t complete dominion over the tablet because they already own one at six or five or have access to it, and they're basically searching it through voice because they don't know how to type. By the time they're 10, 11, 12, 13, they're gonna expect to have that kind of experience, right? And as they get older, they want to be able to talk to devices versus j just touching, for instance, right? But this happens when you're young. Same with the video game generation. The guys who started playing on the Atari, the guys who started playing with the Commodore in the 80s, they didn't stop playing by the time, you know, and using sort of video game interface UI by the time they were sort of in their 20s or 30s. We all assumed it was child's play. Well, guess what? Video gaming is one of the biggest entertainment, actually larger than the film industry as an entertainment medium. It grew with the generations. So that impact is something we need to think about, uh, we feel, because even within your own office, right, you're gonna have 40-year-old people and you're gonna have 30-year-old people and you're gonna have 20-year-old people. You can't make the assumption that someone in his late 30s has anything in common with someone in his early 30s, right? And that is both an opportunity but also a risk. So the other th area I wanna cover a little bit is um, about the next billion. So Lars already talked about the future for the next billion and uh, so I won't go into too much detail on this. But let's be clear, actually it will be five billion. By 2025, there are gonna be five billion people online. There's about three and a half now, about five billion, depending on you know, how fast population growth, it might even be higher. And of course, we can nat naturally expect that majority will come from this part place of the world, China, India, and tons of opportunities in terms of that environment. However, the other billion is going to be people over the age of 65. And that's a segment that is not looked at at all, but it's actually gonna have a very significant impact by 2025. Because by 2025, the average age is going to be 13 years older than it is today. There's about 76 years of age. Right now it's about, you know, uh, 60, 61, 62 years of age average. And of course, in Western developed worlds, it's, it's actually older. So we're gonna have, you know, we're gonna have to deal with people who are 80, 90, or 100 as a general average as opposed to 70 or 80. And that has some in interesting implications, not just for you marketing folks saying, hey, you know, what can we sell, and what can we, healthcare and services, but also potential. What human potential can we unlock that currently we feel is wasted, that we're not doing anything with? Right now, we treat someone who's 70 or 80, or may, certainly 90, as a liability, right? It's healthcare, it's cost. But with technology, with AI, right? With these things which don't require physical strength and don't require actual things that you can, you know, that you needed to have, you know, three decades ago, what, uh, what potential can be unlocked? Whether they're mentors, whether they're, you know, some kind of wisdom that you can have, some kind of brain power that you can extract. Because by 2025, we're gonna have devices that can connect to your brains, right? the actual input isn't necessarily how fast you can type because it's going to be voice or it's going to be a direct kind of implant or whatever it is. You know, transportation isn't going to be the same because everything's going to be automated cars. You just step in. You don't have to worry about affording a driver. These things, all these things pre present an opportunity for the next billion. Right now, there's about 500 million people at the age of 65. And of course, they're going to get older because of technology being better. By 2025, it's one and a half billion according to the World Health Organization. Okay, so... I'll end with this very quickly. Am I fast enough? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'll end with this quickly, which is uh, how many people of you know GitHub? Okay, so the people who likely code or use code. So if you don't know GitHub, you should know it. Even if you're not coding on it, it is the single largest repository of software in the world. It is also the most powerful repository in the world because it has something like 30 million different kind of source code repository that Google, and Alibaba and every major co uh, co company uses, and over 12 million registered developers and growing. Right? Now the reason why I'm pointing this out is because the way that GitHub codes is essentially transparent and open. Right? Now this, I think, is really important for the future as well. Because when we think about what this generation is expecting, those are people who are writing code. That code is what we're using 
is influenced by people who are coding in a transparent and open environment. And by that I mean that basically the code is open for everyone to see. So managers are no longer rated simply by, well, he is, has authority because he is senior or he has authority because he is old. It's he has authority because he is skilled, because his work level or his work quality is for everyone to see. So you're either a really good coder or you're a really bad one and it's, ba it's laid bare for everyone to see. And that kind of respect is important. So skill-based respect becomes, becomes critical. The other thing, of course, is that it kills the traditional view of hierarchy. So it's not a surprise that developers who work on GitHub, when they work for a company, have an expectation that it is also transparent and open and that they want products that are transparent and open, that they expect that because that's the environment that they're coding for. Now, if you take that to a next level and make that assumption, you think about things like uh, sort of transparent and openness, you think about also what do they expect uh, others to use from their product. If you design a product with a transparent and open mindset, in a way, just like a movie creator, because code and engineering is basically content creation, you're actually providing an influence to the user to be transparent and open, right? And of course, Facebook is perhaps the most aggressive example, but that's an example, right? Look how many um, uh, sort of um, companies now all have open APIs for people to access, to code into, to access to. And the idea that you would just basically trade and use APIs and exchange them and do other stuff is really a globally connected, transparent and open system. And uh, people expect that kind of openness. You think three decades ago, you know, a business leader had to be transparent and open about anything, right? But this generation, by the time is 2025, not only will there be something like 30 or 40 million coders on this one that's uh, uh, transparent and open, there's another thing. All the people using this are also using it, um, uh, are also using this uh, around the world in places like China, of course, right? Because Alibaba and, and Tencent, they all use GitHub. So those developers are also working in a essentially transparent and open and quasi-democratic mindset, right? Now, of course, it's not saying that this is a, there's a political agenda behind GitHub, not at all, but that's what's happening. So when people are thinking about, oh, I want to have a more democratic environment, it comes because of the development of platforms like GitHub and what they expect. They expect that in their company environment and they take that forward. In fact, GitHub is becoming the next kind of influence of essentially globalization. The other aspect of that is it's all in English, right? That's the other thing. It's not, there's no Chinese version of GitHub. There's no French version. It's all in English. So English is, of course, the business Franco lingua, but it is also the, w the, the place where you will basically have to expect that English will continue to dominate and will sort of connect the world more. So basically, if you think about how China is going to connect to the world as one of the largest, so the example I gave as one of the largest internet sort of uh, places in the world, they're connected as it's not going to be because the rest of the world is going to speak Chinese. It's because cause all the Chinese are going to speak good English. There's more Chinese people right now learning English than there are Americans in America. And give it 10 years. And anyone who's seen the development of English in some of the Chinese cities in just the last decade can kind of project in the next 10 years how good is their English going to be which has some consequences for something like Hong Kong because that's one of their still differentiating factors, but that's for another time. Now, of course, so I'll close this with, you know, this other idea that as a result, because you're coding in a social environment and in a transparent and open environment, the concepts of knowledge and, net and intelligence have all changed. And that will even be more so by the time 2025 is where network intelligence is shared. And in fact, the more you get intelligence from the fact that you're connected to others not from the fact that you know everything yourself. It's not the I'm the Einstein, it's the fact that I know a thousand people who are really smart who can help me with this and I have access to things like Google that can give me that access. The other thing is not just knowledge for all, it's also that everyone creates knowledge, right? Which is already happening today, but that's gonna accelerate because of course computing power, we're gonna have such supercomputing power by 2025 that essentially the distribution of that knowledge will be available for everyone. So it's not, going, it's not gonna be about you know, what I know, it's going to be about what we, call, what we can all make and perhaps you know, I'll close it with, um, when we think about that generation, you know, going back to that slide about 2025 and our kids and when they grow up in this environment with AI and with all of this available here, um, we should think about our children's learning and education and we should consider that we need to train them for jobs that a computer cannot do. Because of course, by 2025, as Lars pointed out, all these things that actually humans are doing are gonna be replaced. Thank you. <laughs>